Hello everyone, welcome again to Modeling Methods and Mechanical Engineering and today we are going to continue to talk about the solution of partial differential equations, uh, boundary value problems and initial value problems and we are going to shift our attention to the solution of these equations in spherical coordinate systems. See what happens when we uh, try to apply this method of separation of variables and superposition to problems in the uh, R, theta and phi uh, coordinate system or spherical coordinate system. So let's go this is modeling methods in ME and we're going to talk about SOV separation of variables in spherical coordinates now as a premise everything that we've talked about regarding the method of separation of variables applies in whatever orthogonal coordinate systems. So namely, there can only be one non-homogeneity. That non-homogeneity cannot be in the governing equation. If it is in the governing equation, we have to superimpose uh, two solutions and transfer the non-homogeneity to a, to a particular solution that we can figure out or a steady solution that we can solve for. Um, but uh, the non-homogeneity can only be in one of the boundary conditions, or if the problem is transient, the non-homogeneity has to be in the initial condition. If that's not the case, then we need to uh, configure a set of superpositions to make that happen. So we're going to, again, illustrate this concept with the diffusion equation. Um, this is the one that we've been talking about, but this actually applies to many linear types of equations. So consider the diffusion equation. in a problem with R and T dependency that is axisymmetric with respect to phi and theta to begin with. All right, so we have the same equation we're illustrating this with T, V, T being the temperature, but the diffusion equation, remember, can apply to many field problems in science and engineering, uh, where alpha is a diffusivity coefficient, in this case it's a thermal diffusivity. So we have some boundary conditions and some initial condition. If we expand, this is a Laplace uh, operator in spherical coordinates, assuming that there's no dependence in respect to phi and theta, we just simply be 1 over r squared, d dr, r squared, d t dr, where r, remember, is a function of r and t, um, and uh, 1 over alpha, d t, d t, r and t. Um, so we can expand this operator and say this is uh, this is simply um, the second derivative of t with respect to r squared respect to r and t plus 2 over r the derivative of t with respect to r is equal to 1 over alpha dt dt r and t okay so it's almost like the uh, operator how it works in the cylindrical coordinate system we had an r and an r here so it's just the only difference is this two here well that two will allow us to do something very special with this equation because we can do a coordinate transformation not a coordinate transformation but a field variable transformation where we let u of r and t and u dependent variable be equal to r times t of r and t so we're going to replace t times r with u now if that's the case we can take the derivative of u with respect to r and chain rule this out, and this will be r dt dr plus t. And then we can take the second derivative of u with respect to r squared, and that would be r the second t dr squared plus 2 dt dr. So if we uh, differentiate this again, then this is what we'll find. And if you notice that if we multiply these times r, this is exactly this right here. Um, so I'm sorry, if we divide this by r, this is exactly the left-hand side of the equation. So basically, if we 
bring this back to the governing equation. I'm gonna do it on the same page here. So back to governing equation. We get that the uh, second derivative of t plus r squared should be um, du dr divided by r. So this is 1 over r, the second u, the r squared, r comma t. So this is the left hand side, and the, and the right hand side is 1 over alpha. And since t is equal to u divided by r, and uh, this is the differential with respect to time, this will be 1 over r du dt. T. As you can see, this cancels with these, and we essentially retrieve this equation. The, sec the second u dr squared with respect to r and t should be equal to 1 over alpha du dt with respect to r and t. And that is the same governing equation as if this were in Cartesian coordinates. So the equation, the governing equation for u of r and t, it looks like a diffusion equation in Cartesian coordinates. So x and t. So it's the same equation that we are used to solve uh, that results in uh, eigenvalue, an eigenvalue problem in the r direction in this case instead of the x direction that yields solutions cosine and sine. So basically, um, therefore, uh, in, the, in the u direction, well, before we do that, we need to transform boundary conditions and initial condition to u of r and t. So, so that um, u of r and t is just simply r times t of r and t. So whatever t is for whatever value of r uh, and whatever uh, t is for whatever value of time, it's just basically multiply times the coordinate r. So that makes it pretty simple. So after these have been transformed, boundary conditions and initial conditions, solve problem, solve problem as if it were Cartesian. So this would yield solutions in U and R and T is some A cosine lambda R plus B sine lambda R it will yield the solution and uh, I'm sorry, this is the solution instead of u of r and t, uh, this is the solution r of r, so this r of r. So if I can delete this. in R and the solution in time will be equal to some coefficient c e to the minus alpha lambda square t um, and then uh, such that u of R and t is equal to R and R tau of t um, and uh, basically um, and the alpha lambda n is the eigenvalues, and uh, r n of r eigenfunctions, and n of lambda n is equal to the norm. Same thing from Cartesian table, depending on the combination of boundary conditions in the r direction. Right, so basically what we'll do is uh, solve a problem where 
we have a spherical system. And it will be transformed into a problem that is simply in the R direction, where we have a Ri and a Ro. Um, so then, after solving for U and applying the initial condition, then we have the temperature of R and T is simply 1 over R times U of R and T. So that problem is very simple. It's like solving a problem in Cartesian coordinates. It's just that we have to do some transformations at the beginning and then the back transformation at the end. So there's, there's nothing to it. Now what really happens is there is a spectral dependency. So this is what happens if there's just a radial dependency. Uh, and the time dependency, but what if the problem is not axisymmetric? So what if the problem is not axisymmetric? Right, so again, the field variable, in this case t, is a function of r, theta, phi, and t. Remember, we've uh, formulated the spherical coordinate system like this. Where at any point in the surface of the sphere, we pick a point, the radial coordinate will be that, the azimuthal angle will be with respect to the, it's a three-dimensional angle with respect to the z-axis, and the projection of this point into the xy plane and the angle of that projection with respect to the x-axis is the equatorial angle phi. So, the diffusion equation looks like the following. Well, you can express it in compact form as a Laplace of t, r theta phi and t is equal to 1 over alpha dt dt of r theta phi and t. So the same diffusion equation. It's just that when we expand this operator, and assume the t, the field variable, is a function of all um, of all uh, dimensions r, phi, and theta, and time. Then uh, this will result in one over r squared d dr r squared d t dr. So this is the r operator. The theta operator will be one over r squared sine squared of theta d d theta sine of theta dt d theta. The phi operator is 1 over r square sine square of theta d second t d phi square and it's equal to 1 over alpha dt dt which is again a function of r theta phi and t. So this is the expansion of this Laplace operator, which we cover in the first part of the class. Um, so we can, again, expand this operator here. And uh, as we've done before, and this will be the second derivative of t with respect to r squared plus 2 over r dt dr plus 1 over r squared sine squared of theta. The derivative with respect to theta of sine theta dt d theta. We can also chain rule this out. Um, and we'll end up with a cosine and so on. But it's not important right now because we're going to 
alter that. R squared sine square of theta, the second derivative of t with respect to phi squared. And that's equal again to 1 over alpha dt dt r theta phi and t. Okay. Now we're going to make a transformation, not of the field variable, but of one of the coordinates. So we're going to change the coordinate theta. Define a new coordinate. Mu. Where we let mu be equal to the cosine of theta. And therefore, the mu is equal to minus the sine of theta d theta and then therefore the sine square of theta which is 1 minus the cosine square of theta is equal to 1 minus mu square and as you can see we can use this information to replace the sine square and where it appears everywhere and the sine uh, and here the t d the theta uh, with uh, the corresponding mu dependency so notice that dt d theta is equal to dt d mu times d mu d theta, which is a total derivative actually, which is equal to um, minus sine of theta dt d mu. Right. So plugging into, plugging this into governing equation results in the following. So remember the governing equation up here, what we're going to do is uh, keep the r dependency the way it is. So the second t dr squared plus 2 over r dt dr. And then this whole thing becomes 1 over r squared d d mu 1 minus mu squared dt d mu plus 1 over r squared, 1 minus mu squared, the second derivative of t with respect to phi squared is equal to 1 over alpha dt dt. So notice that all sines and cosines disappear from the governing equation by making this variable or coordinate transformation. So very simple transformation and basically what we're going to be solving is now a problem in r mu phi and t so we've eliminated theta and that theta became mu so apply separation of variables to let t of r mu phi and t be equal to r of r m of mu um, phi of phi and tau of tau. This is assuming the same conditions apply for separation of variables that there's only one non-homogeneity that's only in the initial condition. Everything else, all boundary conditions are homogeneous. All right, so this will reduce to r double prime of r divided by r of r plus 2 over r, r prime of r divided by r of r plus 1 over m of mu, 1 over r square, d d mu, 1 minus mu square, m prime of mu, plus, there's one more line here, plus 1 over r square, 1 minus mu square, phi double prime, of phi divided by phi of phi is equal to 1 over alpha tau prime of t divided by tau of t. So now, as you can see, everything on the left-hand side is a function of r, mu, and phi, and everything on the right-hand side is a function of t. And then we separate that with a separation constant that we call lambda square, and we assign a negative number for two reasons, so that the solution in time is a negative exponential decay and the solution in r mu and phi leads to eigenvalue problems okay so so
continuing with the same exact procedure that we've applied so far. The solution in time or the equation in time will be just tau prime of t plus alpha lambda squared <coughs> tau t is equal to zero, which will simply lead to tau of t equals to a times e to the minus alpha lambda squared t. That's the same exact temporal response, right? So when we do problems of Cartesian, it's cylindrical, it's spherical, this is what we get. Um, it doesn't change. The only thing that's different is the value of lambda squared, which is going to be essentially a combination of all the eigenvalues in all the directions. Um, so what we have left now is we'll multiply everything by r squared 1 minus mu squared. So r squared 1 minus mu squared. That multiplies r, prime, r double prime of r divided by r of r plus 2 r prime of r divided by r of r plus 1 over m of mu 1 over r squared d d mu of 1 minus mu squared m prime of mu and then we have the lambda square here close the curly brackets and that should be equal to minus phi double prime of phi divided by phi of phi. Okay, so we've separated from this equation, we separated now this portion, uh, brought the, uh, the lambda square over to the left hand side and send this over to the right hand side, multiply everything by r square one minus mu square, and now the left hand side is only a function of r and mu and the right hand side is only a function of phi, and then we assign a separation constant and we are going to make it positive, m square, so that there's an eigenvalue problem in the phi direction. So, the problem in phi is the usual simple eigenvalue problem, phi double prime plus m squared phi is equal to zero, plus periodic boundary conditions in phi, right? So basically, this will lead to a solution, phi phi is equal to b times the cosine of m phi plus c times the sine of m phi. So we have eigenfunctions in the phi direction such that because of periodicity, sorry, because of periodicity is the only way that this solution can be equal for any value of phi is that is if m are just integer values all the way to infinity. So those are the eigenvalues, these are the eigenfunctions. We've done this before. Now we try to separate r from mu and uh, what we end up with is uh, we're going to divide everything by 1 minus mu square, send all the m's to the right hand side um, so this is r square, r double prime of r, r of r, plus 2 over r, r prime of r, r of r, plus lambda square, is um, is equal to minus 1 over m of mu d d mu of 1 minus mu square m prime of mu plus m square divided by 1 minus mu square and we are going to the left hand side now as a function of r, the right hand side is only a function of mu, and so we're going to use a separation constant, and this time we're going to, the separation constant, we're going to purposely call it n plus n plus 1, and you'll see the reason why in a minute. Well, the reason why, 
The reason why is obvious because the problem in the mu direction now, after using this separation constant, which, which we make it positive purposely to create an eigenvalue problem in the mu direction, is just simply d d mu 1 minus mu squared m prime of mu, which is dm d mu, plus n m plus 1 minus m squared 1 minus mu squared m of mu is equal to 0. And that is the associated Janders equation. We've already solved the Legendre's equation and we know that the solution of the Legendre's equation is in terms of the Legendre polynomials. So the solution in the mu direction m of mu is equal to some constant of integration d times the Legendre polynomial p of the first kind of order um, of degree n and order m, and e times Legendre polynomial of the second kind of degree n order m. So this is now the solution in the mu direction in terms of these polynomials, which are also considered eigenfunctions. These polynomials, remember, are orthogonal. Um, p and m is the associated Legendre polynomial of the first kind of degree n and order m. And likewise q and m is the associated legendrate polynomial of the second kind of degree and an order m. So this is a solution in the mu direction. And all we have left is a problem in the r direction. And the problem in the r direction is r squared times r double prime of r plus 2r r prime of r plus lambda square r square minus n m plus 1 times r of r is equal to 0. So, and then we add plus boundary conditions in r. Whether it, there's only, if the sphere is solid, then there will be just one value of r. Where there's a boundary condition, the solution needs to be finite at the center, so that we'll get rid of the solution that leads to goes to infinity at r equals zero, and if there's a, if it's a hollow sphere, then we have a boundary condition inside the hollow sphere and outside the hollow sphere, and that would actually uh, uh, depend on the types of boundary condition what what solution you will get. But this equation right here, notice that it looks very similar to the Bessel equation, right? Except that there's this two here, and then it's, instead of being mu, is n times n plus one. This is called is a modification of the Bessel equation. This is called a spherical Bessel equation of order n. And we can take that equation and transform it into the regular Bessel equation by letting let r of r be equal to 1 over the square root of r times r of r. So we're going to create a new r R double bar um, by just simply multiplying the original R by um, the square root of R. And if we do do that, we come up, we just do this transformation, it's actually quite simple to do, then the equation will become R squared, R double prime of R, plus R, R prime of R, this is the, the new R with, do, with two bars, um, plus lambda square R square minus N plus a half squared R of R is equal to zero. 
And this is basically the Bessel equation of order n plus one, one half, which has solutions r of r, r double bar, with the constant of integration f, the Bessel function of the first kind of order n plus a half, lambda r, plus another constant of integration g, times the Bessel function y, the Bessel function of the second kind of order n plus a half, uh, lambda r. So through a series of transformation, we're able to relate this problem in spherical coordinates back to the Gendrus problem and Bessel problem. So all we need to do now is to figure out r, we just divide this whole thing by the square root of r. And basically, this is as simple as saying that r of r is equal to f times j of n plus a half of lambda r divided by the square root of r um, plus g times the Bessel function of the second kind of order n plus a half of lambda r divided by the square root of r. But fortunately, these, these uh, particular functions, which are the Bessel functions divided by um, the square root of r uh, at half the order, have already defined. So we can query these functions as, as built-in functions in all mathematical spreadsheets as the so-called spherical Bessel functions. So these are just lowercase j sub n of lambda r is the spherical Bessel function of order n, of the first kind of order n, which is defined as square root of pi over 2r j of n plus a half lambda r, and y n of lambda r is simply square root of pi over 2r of y of n plus a half of lambda r. So in this are the so-called spherical Bessel functions. So as you can see, they're just simply related to the Bessel from the regular Bessel functions of a half order um, by this factor uh, proportional of one over square root of r. Um, and we have the pi and the two there to make it the the actual uh, relation between the two. So the solution, the final eigenvalue solution in the r direction is some constant of integration f1, which is slightly different from f because of the square root of pi and square root of 2 of the Bessel function j, which is a spherical Bessel function of lambda r plus some constant of integration g1 times the Bessel function lowercase yn lambda r. So these are spherical Bessel functions in the r direction. So then therefore the solution in t, mu, phi, and t will follow a triple summation over n, m, and, and l. n, m, and l actually, yes, um, of r of r, m of mu, so r, r, r of r contains the spherical Bessel functions, m of mu contains the Legendre polynomials, or the associated Legendre polynomials, phi of phi are simple sines and cosines eigenfunctions, and t, uh, of tau t is the decaying exponential. So this is a general solution. And there's obviously a constant of integration somewhere in the middle. So we can call that constant of integration C of N M L. So apply initial condition to determine C N M L by using orthogonality properties. of the different eigenfunctions. So those are, well, r of r, 
m of mu and phi of phi. Right? And ultimately, after you're done, don't forget that the mu is the cosine of theta, and therefore theta is the arc cosine of mu. So all we have to do is replace wherever you see a mu, replace it with a cosine of theta, and that, that will be the solution in terms of the actual spherical coordinates. So that's it. That's how you solve spherical problems. And there's a number of problems out there that have been solved analytically. Um, and uh, they're very useful because spherical coordinates actually is uh, the, the coordinate system in which most physical uh, problems actually propagate in acoustics and pressure waves, uh, same thing, electromagnetics, and all kinds of field problems, the field propagates in spherical coordinates, and therefore it's important to know how to, how to address this. Um, obviously, there's uh, many simplifications that can be made. Not always the problem is a function of all spectral directions. It's not always a function of theta and not always a function of phi. Only if the initial condition dictates it to be that way, or only if some combination of the boundary conditions dictate the problem to actually change in spectral directions. Like, for example, when you're dealing with radiation, with heat radiation, there might be a case where actually the radiation is different as a function of the angle. Uh, there's a spectral distribution of, uh, of the radiation field. Uh, only it's a function of how far are you from the source, the R direction, but also a function of how, uh, what's the angle with respect to the source. Um, so this is it as far as the discussion of partial differential equations, both in terms of boundary value problems and initial value problems, how you address them, how you solve them using the method of superposition and separation of variables, um, and how you deal with them in different curvilinear coordinate systems. In particular, we dealt with Cartesian, cylindrical, and spherical. Obviously, this doesn't stop here. There's a lot more to it. And as I mentioned, there's many more um, methods of solution, analytical methods of solutions, that deal with the, some of the shortcomings of separation of variables, namely the method of variation of parameters, uh, Green's function, Duhamel theorem, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, also, we discussed uh, how, to, how to approach this problem in terms of, uh, of uh, approximations uh, through the finite differencing method. But remember, the finite differences method is just one of many numerical approximation methods as well. It's the oldest one. It's the one that seems more logical and how to deal with these, uh, uh, these differentials and how to approximate them. But there are other techniques that are uh, widely used and, and more common in the numerical solution of these problems, namely the finite element method, which is completely different from finite differencing method, the finite volume method, which is completely different from the previous two. Finite volumes is normally used for problems in fluid mechanics, while finite, different, finite elements is normally used for problem, problems in mechanics, structures. There's also the boundary element method, which is also very widely used in acoustics and exterior problems and fracture mechanics, and there's a number of meshless methods. Uh, this will be a continuation of these class uh, in another semester where we deal with these what we call non-conventional numerical approximation techniques, finite boundary element method and meshless methods. So this is it for today. This is it for this course, and I hope you uh, enjoyed it. And uh, I will see you in class then. Goodbye.